Our next speaker is uh, Dr. John Shaw. He's going to talk about status and trends of Aspen in the interior west, a view from uh, Forest Inventory Analysis Group down in Ogden. <coughs> uh, John is a lead analyst for the Interior West Forest uh, Inventory and Analysis Program. He joined the Forest Service in 2003 after completing his PhD here at um, Utah State in forest ecology and uh, working as a research forester uh, for USU Forest Extension. Recent projects include the development of uh, density management diagrams for various species and using FIA data to characterize stand structure and dynamics. John? Thanks. It's kind of nice to go mid-program because uh, every time I do a talk like this, I try and include things that I hope nobody's ever seen before and also things that, that kind of reinforce uh, uh, other speakers that, that, are, that are on the program. And, and it looks like so far I've got both of those covered. <clears throat> I'm going to tell you a little bit about the FIA program, just uh, in case those of you who aren't that familiar with it, find out that some people even inside the Forest Service don't know a lot about what we do. Uh, and then just jump into where we find Aspen and, and give you some, some uh, breakdowns on, on, on what we're finding kind of at the population scale. Uh, I should have time to get into a little bit, uh, looked in on re regeneration because I figure that would be on a lot of people's mind and we're you know, looking at a pretty much population level uh, uh, view here. <coughs> oh yeah, there's uh, right now four sister FIA units. Uh, our states are, are covered there in the blue. Um, it's, a, it's a national program, so we have a, uh, one consistent protocol that's applied nationwide. Um, <coughs> the data I'm going to be talking about today comes from what we call our phase two, which is our basic ground plots. Uh, if you were here for uh, Mike Omaker's talk yesterday, that would have been based on the phase three plots, which there are a lot fewer of, uh, but they collect kind of a different suite of variables than we do on our, on our basic plots. Uh, just to give you an idea for, for the state of New Mexico, every dot up there is, uh, is one of our phase two plots. Uh, there's two different colors there because we changed a new plot design kind of midstream when we were working on New Mexico. Um, and uh, uh, so we have some old and new design. <coughs> this is what the new design looks like. Uh, it's four subplots, adds up to a, a one-sixth of an acre total. Uh, the little ones are the microplots that we do for, for like seeds and saps. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in there, of course, woody debris and that, that I'm, I won't, I'm not going to be going, going into at all today. Uh, that's the basic design. The other thing that we do that's kind of unique is we call it a map plot design, and that there's a theoretical center uh, for the center of subplot one, and then we just plop it down uh, with the basic design. But then if we land in different conditions, let's say there are changes in composition, changes in age class, uh, and some other things that we call conditions, if you were interpreting a photo, you call it a stand. Uh, we draw a line there, we, we track our data uh, by condition. So there are certain attributes uh, that we either record at the plot or subplot level, so they're tied geographically. There's things we do at the condition level that have to do with the stand or the, to some extent the site. Uh, and then there's all these tree variables that are some of the typical mensurational thing like people uh, talked about earlier today, uh, diameters and that sort of thing. Uh, a little bit of other FIA jargon because I don't have to bring it in as we go through this. We used to operate what we call a periodic inventory mode where we would do the entire grid within a state more or less all at one time. Of course, in a big western state, it takes a few years to get all that accomplished. Uh, so this, these are the dates of the last uh, uh, periodic inventories. Some of them, uh, basically the date there kind of represents the sort of midpoint or majority of plots but there is a, uh, tends to be a spread in years, and you'll see that when I kind of get into the year-by-year -year data. When we implemented a new design, um, <coughs> we actually went uh, uh, to an annualized system where we take the grid, we break it up into, in the, in the, terms of in the West, uh, 10 equal panels, and the plots are, are equally distributed amongst the state every year. So we only do one-tenth of the plots every year, but that one-tenth is geographically unbiased. So it's not like we worked on the northeast corner this year, the northwest corner that year, and, and move around. It, the, the plots are all spread around. It adds a lot of work to the logistics, but uh, it turns out it gives us some pretty, pretty interesting data. So all these are the start dates. Uh, hopefully we'll get into Wyoming soon. We're going to start New Mexico this fall. Um, we kind of bootlegged a couple of years in Nevada. We don't really have that under annual yet. 
so when you see diurnal data, you'll see how it varies. <clears throat> so kind of quick, uh, really big overview. Uh, these are all the plot visits where we've had some aspen show up on the plot. There's a whole bunch of them there. We're at the 4,300, something like that right now. <clears throat> there will be more show up in the northern tier as we get the, uh, farther into the annual inventory in Idaho, Montana in particular. Um, <clears throat> aspen is present on about 16 million acres. Um, aspen, what we call an aspen type, that some people have actually mentioned in some of these talks, uh, about 7 million acres. In the interior west states, um, you know, diversity of aspen, you have 52 associated species. If I were doing this west-wide, it would be probably closer to 75 of our tally species. Everything from pinyon juniper up to, uh, to spruce and fir. Uh, <coughs> occurs in 26 different FIA forest types, the way we break ours out. I guess you get an idea. You'll, I'll talk a little bit more about elevation later, but you know, it ranges 2,000 feet somewhere in Idaho to 11,700 feet somewhere in Colorado. So we pretty much have the range of aspen covered. About the only thing we would not pick up in our inventory are very small patches that don't meet uh, basically a, a one-acre patch that's, that's that's at least 120 feet in diameter. So some of those little snow pocket aspen, we, we might see them on our uh, photo, but we might not actually go to them. <coughs> How it breaks out by state, in other words, this is the aspen present, uh, by far dominated by Colorado, Utah, uh, kind of a distant second, uh, and then other states kind of a distant third behind that. What's interesting is, is that the distribution of aspen present versus aspen as a dominant type uh, changes a bit. Um, and as you'll see when I flip the slide, Utah and Colorado actually end up with a relatively bigger piece of the pie. Uh, at the expense of all those other states. And New Mexico and Arizona in particular lose a large proportion of aspen acreage if you're restricting it to an aspen dominant type. And that'll come into play a little bit later as I go through some of the data. And here's just kind of a nice little pie of, uh, of some of that. I actually had to collapse some of the forest types. But uh, I see, I mean, there's the, there's the dominant aspen type on the bottom there. And really five other really major forest types that account for most of the rest of the places where aspen occurs. Uh, it's just a, a kind of a co-player with a lot of these other uh, you know, sort of minor types within the interior west. Uh, <clears throat> a few years ago down in Cedar City when we had a meeting like this, I, I, I presented something on looking at the diversity of aspen. This is an analysis I'm going to revisit. But if you look west-wide, you know, this sort of multivariate analysis kind of reinforces the diversity of aspen communities, uh, depending on where you're at, who your potential associates are. Uh, but it's pretty interesting. I want to fill in that, that upper tier with Idaho and Montana, where it's associated with some of those other um, kind of wet forest uh, species. Uh, current composition, as we, uh, uh, as we look at it, what I'm including here is just the most recent cycle for all the states, so I'm eliminating some of the older data, so it's not kind of double represented in the sample. And what's interesting is that uh, what we're seeing here is you know, there's a, a, an interesting pattern. Actually, Jim Long and I kind of stumbled onto when we were working on some ponderosa pine work years ago, is that you end up with a lot of plots or a lot of acreage in the very pure type, which you kind of expect for aspen. Uh, relatively small representation of all kind of intermediate mixtures. It's, a, it's kind of a weird thing. Uh, and this is not just aspen. A lot of species do this. And then, again, when you get over to where it's a fairly minor component of other types, you end up with a whole bunch of acreage in that, in that category, too. <coughs> and just to uh, kind of go state by state, uh, we, when we were looking at the Ponderosa Pond, we also noticed that um, that pattern, even though it was more or less a rule, had some geographic variations that, as Jim kind of said to me this morning, that it, it kind of begs for an ecological explanation. So I'm not going to go into that here. I'm just going to show you how it breaks out by state. Utah and Colorado being the kind of classic ones with the goalpost pattern. Maybe I'll coin that as the goalpost distribution or something. I don't know. <coughs> um, when you get into those more kind of music forests, you know, like northern Idaho, Montana, um, those pure types tend to be less, uh, relatively less common. And that's a little bit of a thread that we, uh, we kind of noticed with the, some of the Ponderosa data, but we still have need to test that. <coughs> Wyoming, ignore Nevada, it's just the two panels, uh, only 16 plots and all of that. But the interesting thing that comes out of this is Arizona and New Mexico. Um, it just doesn't show up. It's exactly the same sampling protocol, exactly the same plot design. We just don't pick up on pure blocks of aspen like we do in the other states. And again, a well, hypothesis you might throw at this is maybe it has something to do with the other dry land associates, some of the scrub oaks and things like that. Um, maybe something to do with the climate, the monsoon effect, something like that. 
that's causing a lot more uh, mixed stands than these little pure aspen pockets. Uh, but we can test that. I mean, we've got a lot of lots and lots of data to throw at that. <coughs> uh, so kind of going back to this and relating to how composition might relate to stand dynamics. Uh, you know, Paul mentioned. Uh, you know, we're kind of emphasizing maybe serial uh, aspen uh, this time around. Um, you might uh, kind of envision this as, as uh, <coughs> if you were looking at a couple of steps in time, <coughs> stands that were uh, regenerated in a fairly pure aspen state at one time, uh, as succession went by and these conifers started creeping in, you know, that's, that's always a recurring theme here, uh, that it would kind of creep across the diagram. <coughs> and that maybe now we're in a state where they're kind of bunching up against that fairly minority aspen type. I'm not sure that's really true um, or the case because if you were kind of envision that, well, I won't make it the whole height of that thing because at least some of this is the kind of so-called stable aspen type or, or you know, our climax aspen where you wouldn't expect any other associates to come in there. But let's say some fraction of that over time, you would expect kind of a kind of a baby boom phenomenon of, a, of this generational blip kind of moving across. And we just don't, don't really see that, you know, unless you're, uh, basically we would have to assume that we're, we're all the way at the tail end of that and now things are kind of falling off the end of the diagram, which, which in fact some, uh, is probably occurring in some places as Aspen gets uh, squeezed out from, from succession. Uh, but what's interesting, um, if you go into here and, and, and you kind of accept that di idea of age class uh, and regeneration fits into that picture, uh, you say, well, what does is, what is the age distribution of Aspen look like? I don't know if uh, I remember anybody really putting this up here before for, uh, for such a large area. But again, if we look at the all, state, all states, we come up with a pattern that's common for basically all other species in the interior west. We've got the peak that's very strongly related to the settlement area disturbance. Uh, then this big trough that kind of correlates with the success of fire suppression, the wetter years and that sort of thing. And then only in recent years, a little bit of an uptick um, where either you know through drought and fire or, or, or some management activity, we've started to increase those younger age classes. So we really hit bottom about 40 or 50 years ago in terms of regenerating younger age classes. By design or by accident, they're coming back now. Um, but that's the basic distribution. Well, how might that fit into this, to this other diagram? What's interesting is if I take that, which I don't know, if you, you know whether you want to assume or not assume that that is, you know, strongly represents younger age classes, we get a big surprise. If I do the same thing for that in terms of age class distribution, it exactly reflects the population as a whole. So that pure type that we're looking at is, is following the, the kind of disturbance cycle uh, that the, the rest of the West in general has experienced. It's almost a rule now. I mean, uh, and, you know, the lodgepole, ponderosa, all those <coughs> species, they all kind of look the same. That <coughs> um, just came out. The font kind of got blown when I switched machines. The other reason I don't, uh, that I think that this, this pattern is, is uh, kind of an ecologically driven sort of thing and, 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 and not necessarily a, um, a lack of disturbance or whatever uh, affecting it is that if you're looking, especially in Colorado here, to some extent it's visible in Utah, you see a pretty distinct gradient in the Colorado Rockies of uh, stands that are uh, in a minority component aspen to majority component aspen, east to west sort of thing, right up, you know, right, uh, right up the Rockies. Um, if you look at uh, ranges of certain species, gamble oaks, some of the maples and things like that, they follow the same sort of pattern. So this is kind of a biogeographic pattern and it should kind of affect our thinking as to what our aspen, aspen is supposed to look like depending on where we're at. And this kind of gets into the idea that, you know, the classification systems and things that, that uh, Dale talked about earlier. Uh, that little donut around the windows in, Utah, in northern Utah there, uh, a lot of that is uh, where you're in kind of a lodgepole pine aspen mix. It's not, I don't really characterize that as a seral situation because if you think of the bad things that can happen to the stand, like bugs, like fire, it's li is likely to favor the aspen as anything, and, we'll, and I'll talk about that in a little bit uh, 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 right after this. <coughs> when we do go out to a plot, uh, we actually uh, record three different things. It's actually not even part of the um, national protocol, but a thing that we add on the interior west, uh, partially because we're still in this sort of quasi-periodic mode. If we have true measurement, we wouldn't be worrying about this so much. And we record, record whether trees live or dead. 
but in the dead trees, we record whether it's recent mortality or whether it's kind of an old standing dead. And the, and the crews are pretty good at this. It's actually what we allow as a, as a five year window as to what we call mortality, uh, recent mortality or not. So as I go through these next few bar graphs, uh, and I can see a lot of pretty Aspen pictures here. We're all about the numbers and the graphs, unfortunately, but <clears throat> that's what I'm doing here. I'm breaking out the dead, uh, old standing dead versus the, the recent mortality trees. In Utah, I put it first basically because we're here and also uh, because it's kind of got the best history in terms of uh, collecting the FIA data. Um, there was a good, solid, we got a wall-to-wall -wall periodic inventory in the 90s, and then it was the earliest state we implemented our annual, so we get the longest track record there. And, uh, and uh, so you see that, uh, that the amount of mortality when you get to a plot visit uh, has been hovering down there around 1% or so. Um, in recent years where we've seen some of the um, uh, sudden, sudden decline type stands, you see some little upticks in there. Um, but uh, not, a, not a super big jump. Uh, it's, it's, uh, when you get a, this year to year stuff, when you're looking at each individual panel, the sample is smaller. So there's a certain amount of background noise anyway. Uh, so what I did here also was, was, was aggregate those. So I took the periodic, the old periodic inventory and then I took all the annual and bunched that up. And in terms of two different looks at the same population at two different decades, basically, uh, not a huge amount of difference. Uh, not tremendous. Uh, they're a little, a little uptick like we're seeing, but again, you gotta remember some of these sudden decline acres are, are a fairly small proportion of the overall population. We're talking total population here. And I'll just run through kind of the ones uh, for, the, <clears throat> for some of the other states just to give you a uh, you know, comparison contrast here. Uh, you see the same sort of little bit of an uptick with uh, Colorado. You see that the breakdown between when we did the periodic and we did the annual is a little bit different. Uh, but again, you, you sort of see also though the, the value of having this annual data. If it's really smooth, and I think we're going to get some pretty good trend information out of it. And it kind of gets worse as we go down through some of the states. Arizona's not too bad because it's got annual. Uh, the big spike in 2003, probably what, the same uh, phenomenon we saw with the pinion juniper die-off. I've done a lot of work with that, and, and sure enough, we picked up a spike in aspen mortality during 2003 as well. And, and, the, and then this, uh, you know, the aggregate numbers down here shows a little bit bigger spike, and so I think that's real too. Uh, the other states, it, they have sort of a checkered past, a lot shorter uh, annual inventory cycle, so I, I'm not winning too much on those numbers just yet. Um, New Mexico was all periodic, we're just being to annual this year. Uh, but pretty, uh, pretty valuable data overall. Um, it'll be interesting as time goes by. Just a just a um, kind of a kind of a feel good slide as I think about it. Uh, for those of you who get lose sleep over on over Aspen, you know, at night, uh, the yellow bars are sort of our, our, our mortality trend. And I think Mike uh, did this. This is from a report one of my analysts is preparing. Um, uh, the yellow bars are the Aspen in terms of year to year mortality that we're picking up. Uh, the green is the conifers. So it's like, you know, go bark beetles because basically every, you know, bit of conifer mortality may be working in favor of some aspen there. So, but relatively speaking, the conifers right now are much worse off in Colorado than the aspen is. Uh, so analyzing mortality in a little bit more depth, I'll do a little cartoon here just because the next couple of graphs are a little bit complicated. Uh, so they face and explain. So we have our hypothetical stand here. Uh, and I got one aspen, three conifers. So we're calling that 25%, just assuming they're all the same size. So 25% Aspen. Uh, and then we add in our dead, or our mortality component rather. So we just visited the plot. These guys have recently died off. Well now, that gives us a little window into the past, kind of a five year window. And if you recalculate that, of course, you know, that's a 50% Aspen stand because you know there used to be some there before. It's dead now. Uh, there was also a little bit other conifer that's dead. That's what the stand composition uh, works out. And then finally, if we go way back, now the, the dead component doesn't have a, a, a back end window. It's just what's there. Um, so like you can't really put, you don't really know how far you're looking back in this, but so it's a very, it's much rougher than, than the live versus the mortality. Um, but to add in a few more Aspen snags and another conifer, and you end up um, you know, estimating that sometime in the past that thing was about 62% Aspen. And so in the next few slides, what I'm basically doing is I'm taking the difference between what we thought was there sometime in the past, either within the five-year window or even farther back, and I'm differencing them against what the live component is, is uh, now, 
And we're going to see whether Aspen gained or lost based on these old skeletons or recently dead trees up there. I have some surprising results. Now, one thing I'll note here is that uh, the down trees, like in this picture, they don't come into the picture at all. So if all the stuff fell down, it's just it's not accounted for. That's why I say it's a fairly rough view. But in terms of separating the recently dead from the older dead, uh, that's going to give us something. Obviously, this stand, if you calculated that back, it would be a much higher percentage of aspen at some time in the past uh, than it is right now. Because uh, there's just a few live stems and a, and a handful of conifers in there, so it's maybe 50-50 now. That gives you an idea of where I'm going with these slides. <clears throat> so the first time we visited Utah in the periodic inventory, um, my zero is literally zero. I mean, there's not even a 0.001 difference uh, in, in the, the change. Um, if, you, if you add in there, so basically not very many stands had mortality in them. So 70% of the stands we visited basically had no mortality, or it was a pure stand that might have had some mortality, but that doesn't change the composition at all. This is all about composition, maybe you know, not so much about, about overall total stocking. Uh, then when you look peek back, either using the recent mortality or using the old dead, you find out that about equal numbers, about equal acreage, went in Aspen's favor as went against Aspen's favor. So there's also, because we know the other, you know, the other species have their own problems out there, uh, but it really surprised me how, how sort of balanced that was. Now when we came back um, under the annual in Utah, of course that includes the drought years and that, and we are seeing a little bit of the shift to where more acreage, which would be on the left of the, the thing in the parentheses there, um, Aspen lost out on more acres than it, than it gained on, which is what we expect for succession, especially uh, with the uh, um, uh, sudden, sudden decline sort of situation. And again, I'll run through these. Um, in Arizona, you know, as the kind of composition histogram uh, suggests, there's, there, most of them are mixed, so you're going to see some sort of change if you kind of look back in time. Uh, but again, you get this sort of split um, between the stuff that's uh, um, uh, done some gains, done some loss. Uh, so that'll be an interesting thing as, as, we, as we go farther and investigate what, what circumstances uh, um, uh, led to those gains or losses, you know, characteristics of the stand sites, things like that. When you plot them on a map, it's, it's also an interesting pattern, is there's no real spatial thing that you just jumps out at you here. Um, it could have gained or lost almost anywhere you are on the map. Uh, kind of an interesting uh, situation. That's based, but this map is based just on, on, on the uh, mortality trees. If you set it back even farther, you're going to get a lot more stands that changed, either for or against. And this is what the map looks like. So there's a little bit more red than green up there, uh, but uh, with the landscapes changing, and uh, what's interesting, is you, again, you win is kind of jump out, which a lot more to the green, and I think I probably I would attribute that, that to some of the, the pine beetle action and the lodgepole, you know, these lodgepole aspen mixes where it shifted it more towards the aspen's favor. <coughs> Elevation came into play. We talked about that a little earlier today. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this before. Uh, again, one of these patterns we kind of stumble on because of the, the, the wide scope of the FIA data. Uh, but this is looking at all the plots on their you know, latitude versus elevation. Um, and there's sort of an arch to this thing. It has to do with the location of the Colorado Plateau and, and maybe something to do with uh, getting it down into the more monsoonal influence. Um, but uh, it turns out that if you apply kind of a quadratic curve to this, you can kind of normalize it out and compensate latitude for elevation. Uh, so what I did here was uh, I looked at uh, more, the stands that had mortality versus stands that didn't have recent mortality um, and just compared them as to whether it was higher or lower. Um, it's sort of not a fair comparison, but uh, I'll explain that in just a sec. Uh, so where your population is normalized to sort of zero feet, stands without mortality on average, if the debt is a subpopulation of them all, uh, was 40 feet higher, uh, stands with mortality 68 feet lower, no big earth-shaking uh, results there. But like I said, it's not really a fair comparison because even a normal developing stand is going to have some level of mortality of it just due to regular self thinning. Um, so look at, let's look at the more extreme cases. <clears throat> so now I just broke out the stands with the most severe mortality. Um, I think somebody mentioned that they used, uh, used like 25% now as, as severe. Um, turns out that, that uh, um, 25, 75 didn't make much difference in this result. I'm showing 75%. If you don't work that out, stands with severe mortality run on average uh, as a subpopulation, I'm over 500 feet lower than the rest of the population. 
So again, it supports that kind of local scale thing like Jim uh, showed us this morning, but at the entire population scale and overall latitudes. Uh, just for sport, you do the same thing with latitude. It's uh, just, I just did it just for the heck of it. Uh, but it shows the same pattern. No, more north you are, uh, kind of cooler weather. Um, tends not to be as much mortality as a little bit, because it's such a small shift in terms of the huge latitude that Aspen has in the interior west. It doesn't matter that much. <coughs> um, regeneration, just uh, quick on it. Um, I, I did just a quick analysis on this because I compiled all my data at the condition level. And when we're looking at regeneration, we probably need to be more down at the subplot level because what's happening on that little microplot is really going to be strongly influenced on the subplot around it, not so much on the integrated condition, which might be all four, all four subplots. But what's interesting, even at that scale, um, some of the things come out intuitively, like, like we've seen the general results come, uh, in some of these other studies. Uh, stands that have more seedlings in them tend to be a little higher cooler wetter than the ones that, that don't have seedlings, and this is not literally seedlings, but you know, uh, sprouts, these apps. Uh, um, on, on, uh, on average, uh, if they have a little higher basal area, they're more prone to have uh, regeneration in them. And, and what we thought was, would be counterintuitive, that you would have more dead, you would have more sprouts. Um, it's exactly consistent with what they said earlier, that the, the more dead, the, um, the less likely you are to have the regeneration. Uh, and, uh, and another thing that, that really is important at the subplot level is, is you know, I kind of ask the question is where would you expect to have regeneration? Uh, and of course, in very dense stands uh, that are in a self-thinning process because of uh, Aspen's intolerance, you would not expect to have much regeneration in there. So it's okay to have zeros in the data set. And, and at the stand level, um, you still get, you basically, you, you, you see that. It's, it's not a real strong relationship, but the the higher the density of the stand, the less uh, regeneration you're likely to get in, in raw numbers. But there's a huge amount of noise there, as we know. We can have you know, tens of thousands, uh, possibly, out there. Um, so the key points uh, I want you to take home is, you know, the FIA program, it's a very strategic inventory. and operates at really big scales, um, but, but it is unbiased. It's a, it's a strength of the program. Uh, it does offer continu continuous monitoring, which is another going to be a, a, a huge strength. That's kind of what makes me excited to go to work every day is get data always coming in. Um, Aspen as a species, if we're going to worry about it, it's still, still abundant. It's declining at some scales, uh, but the change at a population level or at the species level is not particularly abrupt. It's this localized phenomenon like we've been seeing with the sudden death uh, type stands uh, down at the lower elevations, droughtier situations. Uh, all of our findings, we've not any, uh, basically we're consistent with uh, you know, just an aging population. Uh, successional trends are apparent in, in the data. Uh, we're obviously over, overdue. Remember that age histogram where, where a lot of stands overdue for disturbance. Uh, we're getting some catch up because of fire and the drought and all that sort of thing. Um, uh, computer, communities are very, are very diverse. Uh, so uh, there's some universal trends and some things we just really got to develop locally. Um, so in the future, you know, as we get annual inventory implemented, it's going to be a, a great data set. Uh, true remeasurement, which a lot of this sort of fudging I did, or or our five-year window for mortality, um, uh, that's we're not going to need that anymore because we're doing tree-to-tree -tree remeasurement in subsequent cycles, uh, and so that'll eliminate a lot of the uh, uncertainty. We'll be able to get snag longevity and things like that out of it. Uh, and we've got a lot of other questions, and, and we're always open to to hear what other people are are interested in looking at. Uh, uh, because there's a lot, still a lot of open questions in there, and some we'll, we'll be able to look at our data and say whether we can have the potential to answer them or not. That's it. Yeah. Well, so back in the middle of the talk, we were uh, looking at the mortality trends over time, mm -hmm. and it didn't really show any marked increase in mortality. I've seen that before. So I think we have my data, and I'm wondering how you uh, uh, can rationalize how that fits with what we see on the ground and what the area surveyors are saying. There's a tremendous increase in mortality. Uh, well, like you said, you're, you're looking at 13%, estimate 13% of Colorado uh, acreage, but you ran that, your survey acreage against the Aspen type in Colorado. It's 13% of the Aspen. Aspen cover type, but if you look at how much acreage has, but we don't know if the acres that you're looking at necessarily fit the Aspen cover type. 
some of those are probably in what we, or what we would call, you know, the, uh, what I call here the asking present. So maybe you're down more in the five or six percent range. So we're talking about uh, maybe not complete mortality on some fraction of the five or six percent. You weigh that against the population; it's it, it kind of the rest of the population kind of washes it out. So, so it's not like we're missing it. Um, and, and we learned a lesson with the Pete and Juniper analysis is we, we picked up on the PJ just instantly. I didn't put the slide in here, but if you look at that uh, article we did in the Journal of Forestry a few years back. I mean, you see the trends came out just this just really smooth. Uh, we're, it's there. It's, it's certainly there if you if you kind of get into the data. But you got to remember, we're sampling the landscape or or conditions that occur on the landscape mixed aspen, pure aspen, whatever, in proportion to their abundance on the landscape. So if we're, uh, when we're seeing one thing, it's, it's maybe because the, the majority of what's out there isn't, you know, isn't experiencing that problem. It doesn't exclude. Uh, it's, just, it's just buried down in there. And I think what would be interesting is to take what, what people have found at the localized studies and then, then stratify out of that, then see what the mortality is, then you'll see your big blip. It, it shows up in there now, but it's but it's uh, but it's, again it gets washed out. Yeah. I have a question, John. When you looked at the age class distribution, have you segregated the stands where there's aspen present versus aspen yeah. stands, and looked at it and seen if the age class distribution is the same? Well, yeah. That's I, I didn't show the third graph in there because basically you subtract the top age class from the bottom age class, and you get the same thing again. But, but that's basically what the implication of that slide was. If you look at the mixed stands versus the pure stands versus the whole West, other species, they all show exactly the same history of disturbance, uh, which is sort of freaky. <laughs> uh, and, we're, and, and this is the first time I looked at that is when I was preparing for this talk. So we're going to investigate that a little more and see why. And like, I said, like Jim said, it's kind of begs some sort of explanation as to what's going on, especially those ones that, that just have very low levels of uh, you know very low acreages, all those all those intermediate mixtures. Why does that occur? Yeah, I mean, any species you look at in the West, it's lots of this, lots of this, and very little in between. If anybody has a hypothesis, they can throw that one at me. Oh, I think, yeah, I think that's true here. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the stuff that's kind of the borderlands, that Cedar Mountain. Uh, I would just say, like, at Cedar Mountain, there's probably some fraction of it that could hold conifers based on topography and that. But I, there's a lot of it here. You're on that kind of sagebrush edge. Or in Alaska, we had that same thing up there on these uh, south-facing slopes. It looked just like here because they were, was asking border and sagebrush in here in Alaska. And they're, they're not going to get any spoiled spruce in that at all. Uh, so it's just it's 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 Aspen on the edge, and uh, and I think we're we're seeing sort of a sort of a check going on because they kind of got I got lazy in the lush 70s you know what cooler moisture and uh, fattened up a little bit now a little drought comes along and they're and they're hurting so uh, you know that those are the, that's why it's sensitive to that I mean, that's why I, you know I, I, it's good to hear people say not as, all Aspen are the same because it's there is that variation. Hey John, um, following up on that, and I'm sort of a request, I guess, is it possible that we could get a snapshot in time of what percentage of the, of the total FIA survey is, is pure Aspen category versus zero? There's been a few things published in the past, something of my own, but they're, they're, they're really rough shots. And this is yeah. debated and thrown around. I think that would be of high value, even if it could be broken down by state, just some rough percentages of pure as a starting point. And essentially, it could be a classification scheme or something, but as a starting point, I think well, well, we, we could take a rough whack at it now based on some, okay, relatively low for your latitude, relatively dry for aspect, and things like that. Um, and, and say, well, those most likely you're not picking up any conifers because on those same sorts of sites you don't see any other conifers. But when you do that, the nice thing is is that starting in 09 or 2010, uh, we're going to implement our new phase two understory veg protocol, which should start to shed some light on what these other associations are. Um, and so some of the understory, the, uh, the forbs and, and shrubs and that ought to give you an indication as to whether 
they indicate that conifers could be there or not if, if they're absent on the actual plot. There are things we, where we have multi-condition plots where we split it, and one condition happens to be the conifer or a mixed conifer aspen, the other one's a pure. So, well, you know, maybe the pure one's just, just where the aspen is kind of, you know, moving out into a gap or some old disturbance or something like that. Uh, so, there's a lot of ways to get at it. We just, it, the data set is so vast, we just need to have three pretty specific questions and we'll just jump in there and, and look at it. We're going to cut it off. That's good. Thanks, Josh.